then you'll start to look at the possibilities of doing large-scale greenhouses where you grow food in the city. So that means as planners, you should be start to start to think about where in the cities you might want to actually be locating food growing operations. This is by Gordon Graff, and uh, Gordon did his thesis, finished his thesis last year at the University of Waterloo's uh, architecture school, and it was on a high-rise uh, farm, shown here. Um, another one of the competition entries um, at resilientcity.org was this one I thought was quite brilliant. Um, it deals with a problem happening in a, a number of American cities. Um, I don't know that if there are any Canadian cities where this is the issue. I think maybe Winnipeg may be a, have this problem. Um, have you heard of food deserts? <laughs> yes, I see heads nodding. A food desert is a, is a place in a city where the, the residents are not really served by any good access to grocery stores. They can only get their food from uh, Max Milk and those types of places. Uh, because they're just the, the, the retail, there are no retail operations for whatever reasons in those areas, and typically socioeconomic reasons. So this individual was looking at the, the possibility of using existing infrastructure to piggyback um, on food distribution. And so he was looking at the existing bus system in Detroit. By the way, Detroit is a huge food desert. Um, and tacking onto the back a few uh, food distribution uh, network with these sort of these uh, carriers back of buses would be really a market and they'd stop at the major stops and the bus would stop for longer than it typically did and a market would open up and here's the, the locations of where these markets would be in Detroit and then you'd get off and the, it would open up at the back and there'd be a market and I'm not sure how viable this is but it gives you a sense of thinking about things that we take for granted or integral parts of our current um, infrastructure system that may be able to be transformed as opposed to it's wrong, it's not working. How can we transform it? How can we tweak it? How can we see new things in the typical and the understood as ordinary right now? So I thought that was actually a brilliant, very thoughtful um, uh, idea. And he even thought that maybe you could have, like they do in, in in South America, entertainment on these buses as well, to attract usage. Brilliant uh, uh, collage here. Um, one of the other things that, that uh, Jeff Rubin in his book, um, Your World's About to Get a Whole Lot Smaller, made the point of, is that as energy scarcity um, starts to kick in, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, all of the transportation systems that provide um, transport of goods and services around the world now will start to become a more important cost in the overall cost equation um, of that enterprise. <laughs> what am I trying to say? We have in the last 20 years in North America been, been outsourcing all of our blue collar work, all of our manufacturing work, um, most of our our uh, agricultural work has been, and our fishing for that matter, has been outsourced to Asia and other parts of the developing world. And the reason that's been done is because, well, the people that own the businesses realized that labor was cheaper over there and the manufacturing will go where our labor is the cheapest if there are open markets and if transportation costs are almost zero. But if all of a sudden to ship products across the world cost a lot more, like it's a big part of the equation, then all of a sudden local manufacturing, and I think this is the only local manufacturing left in, in Western Ontario, the Campbell's uh, Leamington uh, tomato soup plant, um, will actually be viable again. So what's that mean to you as planners? Well, all of those lands in existing cities that were now are now termed employment lands because they used to be where employment happened and now doesn't, will potentially be good sites for re-employment or relocalization of manufacturing. So think about it, manufacturing, blue collar manufacturing is coming back with energy scarcity. Um, that's a very positive thing um, and as Homer Dixon pointed out, probably will be smaller scale and there won't, there won't be the variety but at the same time you as planners are going to have to look at how that gets accommodated within your community and city plans. 
And redundancy, um, develop and implement utility redundancy. We talked about this earlier. Um, again, all of our utilities are, um, well, not all, but in the older cities in Canada and the United States, um, they're really at the end of the useful life. So we have an opportunity now to start to say, how do we implement the um, development of utilities in our cities? Do we just put big, huge, cost-efficient, engineering-effective um, plants, <coughs> one place in the city, big water plant, big electrical plant, big sewage plant, or do we spread them out over the city to potentially increase resilience? We were asked this question um, by the city of Edmonton, and um, we said, okay, well, if you're going to be implementing a greater um, degree of development, or you're going to be developing more um, utility infrastructure in the future, what kind of utility infrastructure are you looking at? Well, they're potentially looking at more electrical power infrastructure, and they're potentially looking at more waste, sewage waste, um, uh, excuse me, um, uh, sewage waste treatment infrastructure. And we said, well, what happens if instead of putting a great big gas-fired electrical plant just outside the city, you start to distribute those throughout the city? And not only did you distribute them throughout the city, but you started to make them modular. You started to connect other pieces to them so that they could become not just more resilient because of the, the, the distribution of them, um, but maybe you could hook up a waste um, processing plant to one of them, a small waste processing, neighborhood or community waste processing. And maybe that could be a green machine, um, green machine, a doctor, uh, John Todd, um, out of uh, Hamilton originally, uh, famous for creating things called green machines, which are basically greenhouses um, in which you take black water, wastewater, sewage, and you run it through a series of um, biological filters, plants, that take out the nutrients um, and, out the, uh, and take out the what would be considered harmful organics and basically purify the water so it's drinkable at the other side. And in, in doing that, produce biomass that actually can be used as fuel. So that's interesting. You connect one sort of utility need to another sort of utility needs, and these can be quite small. They don't have to be huge monster plants. They could be neighborhood-sized facilities. And what happens if you also said, well, let's leave a little bit of space on that site, and in the future, it won't work now because the economics aren't there, but what about in the future when food prices are being driven up by energy scarcity and all of a sudden local greenhouse growing, urban greenhouse growing, remember Gordon Grass building, might work on a smaller scale. So you've got a little power plant, you've got a little waste processing plant, and you've got a little food processing plant. Now they're not all in the same building, but they're on a site that would be very much integrated using energy um, kicked off by one, the, the power plant turns out a whole bunch of energy that is just thrown out as, as waste heat, would power the two greenhouses. One greenhouse would produce biomass for the generator and the other greenhouse would produce food. So these are very simple ideas, but they're ways of looking at building resilience at the same time as solving some of the future problems of cities that have to deal with um, uh, utilities reaching the end of their life. I'm not saying go and do this, I'm saying look for opportunities in existing problems to find opportunities for making things happen that are in addition to solving the problem at hand, they're, the, they're also an opportunity for building resilience. And you don't even need to say to your client if they don't get it or don't want to talk about resilience that you're building resilience. You just know that as you're doing these things, resilience will be um, increased. Um, and everyone's probably seen this picture. It's um, New Orleans, after Katrina ripped through it. Uh, and uh, one of the things that I think, as I mentioned earlier, that we all want to be starting to do is taking um, the environment more seriously in terms of how we plan cities, and neighborhoods, communities. Um, there are many reasons why this happened. Um, but certainly down the road, we'll want to be looking at, as we plan cities, taking very seriously the environmental um, integration of our planning with 